I'm 21 years old, and it's very hard for me to understand that they want to put me to death. Uh, I can't understand. I mean, when I first got here, I was uh, I was scared. I mean, I was so scared that I, I threw up at, at night. You know, I, I got so scared I would throw up, and I couldn't eat. And they thought the reason I wasn't eating because I was trying to be a hard ass. No, I was just uh, scared, sick to death in my stomach. And uh, when I would go out the shower, up my legs would wobble, you know, because of fright. I didn't know what to expect. And it's entirely different from a person who's on the street and he gets hit by a car because he didn't know that was going to happen. But here you're told in advance you're going to die. And every night you lay awake, you think about it, you say, Wow, will it really happen? And you say, what will I do? I mean, uh, how will I react when the time comes? Will I go crazy? Will I, I just, how would I react? They cage me up like an animal. And <clears throat> whenever you get out of line, to get, get your rights that they've taken away from you, try to get them back. They say, oh, you're acting like an animal, you know. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, what is human behavior under these conditions? I mean, what is normal for a man to react when he's told he's going to have to die, when, he's, when everything's taken from him, his life? Your mail's censored. They read your mail. They read, uh, you take a visit. They're standing over your shoulder. They know everything you're saying. You shower. They're watching you. At night, they're shining flashlights in your cell. You know, you never have a free moment. Uh, and I asked you, what is normal behavior? I mean, if whatever it is, uh, I don't know it. All I know is what's happening now, the present, and it's, it's a nightmare. The relentless passage of time that separates the condemned inhabitants of death row to their predetermined execution initiates a psychological stress so unique unto itself that leading psychiatrists have labeled the anomaly with its own moniker. Close your eyes for one moment and try to imagine your entire existence being confined to a 6 by 9 foot cell, with your reading material and human contact severely restricted, alongside the ever-present shadow of execution looming over you, lingering in your mind as the only foregone conclusion left to contemplate. It's inconceivable. The capability of grasping the emotional torment derived from consecutive years of torturous uncertainty and hopelessness is beyond the realm of possibility. The sharp deterioration of a prisoner's mind and spirit ensued from sustained periods of isolation and despair can only be fully understood by those who have experienced it. But what exactly is the death row phenomenon? Does it consist of the long wait in which a prisoner endures on death row? Or is it the callous, dehumanizing conditions of imprisonment? Death row in the United States is aptly described as a prison within a prison due to the heightened security and minimal freedoms, and is often considered an institutionalized hell. The strict regime is usually justified by the explanation that a prisoner on death row has nothing to lose, and may be capable of just about anything. Words such as harsh and brutal are often used, but they cannot capture the transformation of a human being into to a caged animal. Amid countless horror stories from prisoners on death row, a terrifying vision of the system emerges, detailing conditions that have led to such physical and mental deterioration that some prisoners have been reduced to little more than the living dead. It's a pretty weird thing being in here, looking at everything going on, and not really, not really know what, what really is going on because you stay in the darkness all the time. It's a spiritual darkness with the devil working on you at all times, trying to break you down to be a human rat or whatever. Or something unreal. It's kind of hard to forget about. Try to wonder. Off from the world, that's all I be trying to do, one off from it, because ain't nobody as good here as they, they all out for the money, the big take. I've been here four years, a couple months, a few days now, and uh, just sitting here has a tremendous effect upon one's age. 
mentally and physically. Like I talk to some of the fellas around here and uh, tell them I'm 28 years old and it's, I mean, uh, it's almost impossible for them to leave. Uh, being here on death row has a uh, mental effect on one that uh, the average person couldn't believe. Uh, and uh, after so long, uh, it uh, has just told, just totally ages you uh, 10, 15, 20 years beyond what your age is. And because one is here on death row, one is just in limbo, you know. He uh, doesn't know whether he'll see next month, next year, whatever, you know. It's, it's always uh, just, it's just steady wonder, you know. The isolating and restrictive environment in which condemned prisoners are kept is not exclusive to those sentenced to capital punishment. The conditions of death row in the United States mirrors those of solitary confinement, also termed administrative segregation. Its practice can differ from one prison to the next and the precise details of how it is carried out, yet one fundamental element is commonly shared, which is the reduction or complete elimination of intersubjectivity. Being with others is part of the very structure of human substance. Our social nature depends on empirical encounters and essentially signifies our own existence. Our brains are hardwired from birth to be oriented with social constitution, and this is an existential characteristic that makes the human experience what it is. It co-determines our relations with the world around us. The very objectivity of life as encountered depends on others, which is referred to as transcendental intersubjectivity. It's based on the perception of our immediate environment. We see things not as mere surfaces, but as multi-sided objects based off the perceptual perspectives of others. Prolonged restriction of this psychological relation can lead to a specific type of derealization that makes things that are genuine in existence no longer feel real. It can cause depersonalization and total erosion of the sense of reality. A pathological and subjective detachment from the external world, an estrangement from one's body and even from mental processes will occur, and all sense of individual identity identity will diminish over time. Between one's perception and that of another, there exists an internal relation which causes the other to appear as the completion of the human motor system. It involves the motor resonance of mirror neurons, the most applicable term in the field of neuroscience relating to human connection. Short-term isolation is used almost everywhere as a form of punishment for breaches of prison discipline, yet the majority of Western countries have set a limit to the amount of time an individual can be subjected Objected to this type of disciplinary procedure. Most of Europe and Canada have a 15-day limit on the use of solitary confinement, and longer appliance is considered torture and officially prohibited by law. The United States, however, has no such legislation, and an inmate's time frame subjected to segregation can range from days to decades. It, it's, it's impossible to, to put into words. That's where I put in that one part about, about my anger, and, and, and a, a sense of, of, of continuous silently screaming, right? I'm not talking about screaming like, oh, I'm talking about if you could put every emotion uh, of the human spirit uh, of hopelessness, pain, agony, hatred, uh, uh, all these emotions, in, uh, uh, frustration, um, uh, while you're locked in this cage, treated like some animal, you think that's making that person better? You think that's making uh, everybody safer? Right? Uh, this is still a human being. This is a real stressful situation. Daily, uh, I've been here approximately 15, 16 months. Uh, days are uneventful. Uh, one day flows into the next. Pretty, pretty much uniformity. Uh, they don't. There, there's no, there's no real human inter interaction. It's really, it's, it's really hard. If you don't have no, ste no uh, steady outside communications, this place really begins to bear on you.
Mr. Marsh, you have any lunch today? Did lunch come? Did you accept lunch? Like to talk to me, Mr. Marsh? Yeah, as you know, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we're getting ready to send you over to Marion. How do you feel about going to Marion? Can't say. All right, we're gonna send you off and then we'll look for you to come back all healthy again. Okay? Really ain't got no one to really talk to. You know, if you have uh, anger issues inside or you're stressing about something, you know, what do you got to do? Just hold everything inside, you know? Mm -hmm. Either that or just let it all out. You know, if you let it all out, you know, you're going to get in trouble. You end up hurting somebody, you know, or something. So you just keep it all inside. This sucks, <laughs> to put it simply. Uh, I, I think that maybe... Maybe there, there's a reason for an institution like this, but I think that uh, for the most part, this place is abused. I mean, it, it's all about money, this, this system that I'm a part of. Uh, I, I don't believe that they're gonna leave an empty bed in an institution like this where they've spent millions and millions of dollars to build it. People get sent here who don't deserve to be here. I believe I'm one of them. I'm not telling you I'm an angel, because I'm not. In 18 years, I've done plenty. But I haven't done anything that merits being sent here. You, 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 you numb up. You try to, you know, close your feelings off where you don't try to feel nothing. You uh, feel like there's no hope. I don't think no human being should have to live in this shoe, especially as long as we have lived in the shoe. Mm -hmm. You know. reality TV. You know, I make my own reality and television entertainment. And I got the hound dog. I like the hound dog. Oh, 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 oh. Hound dog. Hot on that gal tail. Hot on that tail. Oh. You know, that's good entertainment too, you know, keep myself entertained. Try to, then, you know, like I said, I be having suicidal thoughts and so I try to keep myself in good mood most of the time, right? When you look in the cell, you can't see out the window. I don't know, man, I mean, that's an old torture technique cause uh, deterioration of the brain. You know, the brain needs uh, sensory, like any organ needs exercise sensory deprivation. That's what it's called. <laughs> Strength, well-being, and health. Yes. Just something I try to focus on. Um, if, if there's anything I, I, I want to stay my mind on, it's, as I always say, it's something progressive. So being strong and having a, a, a good disposition and being in good health are certain, certain things I definitely want to uh, focus on. Although severely debilitating to the mental condition, an individual in regular segregation still has the presupposed luxury of extended life. The opulence of continuance that is so often taken for granted allows for yearning and initiative, eventuating growth, and relative prosperity no matter how adverse the environment. Um, this week we're going to um, finish up the fractions. We're going to do the multiplication and division. So the tape was already on this morning. Did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah, it's been on all morning. Yeah. Okay, good. But you did real good on that quiz. If you have any problems, you know, put a big question mark on your page. Got it? You did real good on it. This component will often afford a prisoner the motivation and focus needed for psychological survival during extended periods of solitary confinement. Living on death row doesn't allow for this preserving remedy, but instead subsumes uncompromising dread in incertitude to take its place. Added to the living conditions of what many regard as cruel and unusual, prisoners on death row are also subject to the element of delay, and this is a fairly recent development. In the 19th century, execution 
abortions took place within days or even hours of a death sentence being rendered. Delays have steadily increased in length and are now measured in years. Consider the average length of time between sentence and execution in 1951, which was just one year, to the average stretch in 2019, which is 21 years. These steadily increasing delays are predominantly caused by two factors. The first is that support for the death penalty is declining in America. State officials are more cautious in their approaches to executions, and politicians are sensitive to public opinion. When a state official wants to avoid responsibility for executing a prisoner, they can grant stays and remand the case for further review, which can take years or even decades to conduct. The second factor is the increase in laws which protect a prisoner's rights, coupled with an increase in appeals to human rights tribunals, which lengthens the time needed to dispose of a case. This is somewhat ironic, as prolonged detention on death row is seen by many as a constitution of cruelty, yet the prisoner's willingness to accept and even encourage delay has aided in its concession. It's part and parcel with human nature that an inmate would be unwilling to accelerate the process that will lead to their death. The instinct to survive forces them to welcome otherwise intolerable delays in adverse and psychologically torturous living conditions. The death row phenomenon is somewhat of a developing concept, yet with the aforementioned considerations in mind, it can be defined as a prolonged stay under the harsh conditions of isolation while subjugated to a constant state of uncertainty and apprehension. The neurological impairment and psychological dysfunction among inmates awaiting capital punishment has sought a growing number of studies to examine the mental state of a prisoner immediately prior to execution. Though dead men tell no tales, those who believe they are about to die and have spent years subjected to the death row phenomenon can tell us a great deal about their experience and provide us with an invaluable source of information. The following interview is with 53-year-old Oscar Ray Brolin, conducted on January 6, 2016. He was a former truck driver found guilty of the rape and murder of three female hitchhikers in 1986. The following converse took place 22 hours before his scheduled execution by lethal injection. So I, I gotta ask you, how, you, how are you feeling this morning? <laughs> Mm -hmm. A little numb. I mean, I don't know how to just, how you would expect someone to feel. I mean, if they told you tomorrow you're dying, how would you feel? It's not something we all die, but it's knowing your exact date and time. That's that's hard to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I'm at peace with myself. I mean, as far as it's my release. My punishment's over. I've been here 28 years now. I'm tired. So. You've been here 28 years? I've been locked up 28 years since December 9th, 1987. So I'm a little tired. And I'm in confinement. And explain what that's like. Imagine spending 28 years in this room. There's no way to describe it. It's ex exceptionally, it's exceptionally difficult. Incoherent or slurred speech, and especially the mispronunciation of intricate words, are heavily correlated with solitary confinement. This is simply due to lack of converse and the confined subject not having an outward source, and thus no reason to verbalize specific words too. The limited contact that a prisoner has with correctional staff in segregation won't necessitate the use of expressive vocabulary, and although the wording will still be recognized in the subject's thought process, the muscle memory in which to articulate certain terms terms will often be forgotten. I've had a lot of support. A lot of people could love me and care about me. A lot, of, a lot of support outside. That's made it a little easier. But still, it's very difficult to spend 28 years in a room like this. A lot of thinking? You have to be able to look in the mirror and like yourself. Do you like yourself? Yeah. I'm comfortable with myself. There's a lot of things in my younger, in my past, um, you know, I wish I could change, but I'm at peace with myself. The state's about to kill me, and they think they're getting justice, and I'm like, well, they're not getting justice. They're just going to kill somebody else. I was like, 
and I was like, they killed me 28 years ago when they locked me up. Now they're just releasing me. So you're saying you didn't murder these women? No. You didn't murder Natalie Holly? No. Stephanie Collins? No. Terry Lynn Matthews? No. I didn't know. I'd never seen them. Never met them. I hadn't, I, I, it, I, I met them through photographs, through crime scene photos, through newspaper articles. I've gotten to know them fairly well through newspaper articles and crime scene photos, police reports. So 10 juries convicted you though? Yes. 10 juries heard the same evidence repeatedly over and over and over. Nothing changed. Evidence linking you to the murders? <clears throat> yes, people's testimony and the physical evidence. What physical evidence actually linked me? There's what hair might, and fibers, right? Hair and fibers that Mike Malone prepared. It's worth noting that the evidence was conclusive, and his guilt wasn't just beyond all reasonable doubt, but virtually beyond all doubt. His only defense was conspiracy, which can sometimes hold weight in cases with influential or affluent figures, such as Ziavuddin Magomedov or O.J. Simpson. Yet this individual was a truck driver with just over $200 in savings at the time of his arrest, and his victims were all female hitchhikers, with almost no family and certainly no influential connections. There would be no reason whatsoever for any sort of authoritative administration to conspire against him. He may come across as genuine, yet anyone would if they had 28 years to prepare a performance. Are you going to have anything final to say right before the injection? No, it's my release. They're not going to get no justice out of that. They won't. If, if anything, they'll leave angry. They'll say, well, that was too easy. There was nothing there. Is it going to change anything for them? When they wake up the day after, is anything going to be different? Now I'm not going to be there. Where's their focus of their anger now? They're still going to be without their child. They're still going to be numb. You know, maybe it won't happen today. Maybe it'll happen a week or six weeks, or maybe something will happen a year down the road or whatever. That they'll say, well, wow, maybe something will change. They'll say, well, maybe I want to look at the evidence. Mm -hmm might be too late for me, but they owe it to their child. I would if it was my child. They owe their child that much. Are you going to be looking at them right before you're executed? Well, if they're in the window, I probably will. Eye to eye? You're going to look at all of them? Well, I don't know. It depends if I can see them or not. But you plan to? Oh, if I can see them, yes. And will you say anything? I don't know if I'll say anything because I don't know if it would do any good. Did they tell you what time the execution takes place? Well, I think it's scheduled for 6 p.m. But I was like, after 28 years of this, <laughs> it's been in this box for 28 years, it's a release. My punishment's over. They can't hurt me no more. Right. But hopefully someday the truth will come out. That's, I mean, it might be too late for me. It's too late for me 28 years ago. I came to prison 28 years ago. So, uh, had I not had been in prison for the Ohio case, maybe now this would have happened. Maybe my credibility would have been different. I don't know. It's, in hindsight, you can sit back and say, well, there's a lot of what ifs or I should have, but you can't change that. We get one go around. Mm -hmm. And I have to accept the hand that was dealt me. Some of us don't get the opportunity. Dying down there is not as bad as dying in a car wreck or upside down in a ditch or in a house fire or, or like the victims died. Or, I mean, there's many worse ways to go. I mean, at least I had the opportunity to say goodbye to my people. He continued to state his hope in the so-called truth eventually coming out, while asserting that he knew it was already too late for his own cause. Yet he would have been well aware that over 40% of the stays of execution in Florida are granted on the final day, often within just hours or even minutes of the scheduled execution. This would have been what he was clinging on to, yet his efforts were in vain, and he was put to death by way of lethal injection at 10.16pm the following night, with the execution taking 11 minutes to carry out. His 
last meal was a medium rare ribeye steak, a baked potato with butter and sour cream, a lemon meringue pie, and a bottle of Coke. When asked if he wished to make any final comments before he was put to death, he replied, No, sir. It's relatively common for prisoners on death row to assert their innocence to the grave. Some even declare it during their final statement, which many psychiatrists believe to be a final act of defiance, somewhat of a last gambit of control over the emotions of others. Some will even insult the victim's family or make a joke. Most will express remorse or ask for forgiveness. Some will quote religion or philosophy, while others will focus on their own family behind the glass screen. Such was the case of 66-year-old Earl Forrest, who said nothing for his final statement but mouthed the words, I love you, to his 35-year-old daughter as a lethal dose of pentobarbital was being pumped into his body. He was found guilty of shooting dead two criminal acquaintances as well as a police officer during his arrest on December 9, 2002. The following interview took place three days before his execution on the 8th of May 2016, and is one of the limited instances where the subject appeared to be completely truthful with regard to all aspects of his situation. In my early 20s, I started selling speed, and that's what I've continued doing all my life. Why'd you sell drugs? Uh, money is really good, and uh, you know, you're your own boss, and I like working for myself. And uh, it's just like, it's like being a rock star. When you get up there high enough, you know, it's like you got rock stars and politicians and televangelists. Well, drug dealer gets his own following. Now, meth was really bad in those times, in those arcs. Did you feel bad at all about helping to spread it? No, man, you guys got this crap out here they call meth but it's it's not even it's clo not even close it's battery acid and uh or strips of batteries and just all kinds of weird shit and it's nothing like meth like california where it, it's you know and uh yeah no i i didn't feel bad it's i mean it was all right here like you said yeah. how'd you meet toddy she, uh, I ran into her husband in a grocery store. I guess I was 21. And uh, him and I were in Boy Scouts together a long time before that. And uh, he, uh, I sold him, I, I had just heart grown a, uh, some weed. And I, he wanted to know if I had a pound to sell. And I said, yeah. So he came over and he brought Toddy with him, that's his wife, and uh, that's how we met. How did the trouble with you and Toddy start? Well, uh, she uh, she wanted me to hook her up with some, uh, you know, well, first time she wanted to buy a couple pounds or whatever, and she said she'd come and get me and uh, drive me back to, you know, back here. And so I, I got her a couple, real, real cheap, like like eight thousand for both of them. And uh, so she come back, she made, you know, you make a lot of money at eight thousand, four thousand a pound. I didn't want to do it, you know. I just, I told her for a long time, I, I don't want, nah, you know, I don't. But after uh, after a while, I said, okay, but here's the deal, you. Uh, I'll hook you up with a guy in California, and you buy me a, a nice riding lawnmower because I had a big lawn and some and the pasture, you know. And uh, she said, "Yeah, okay, fine, yeah, you know," because she make that much in a minute out here. And so um, I get, I hooked her up with a guy, and uh, that was the last I heard of her. <laughs> And I, I called her maybe three times after that, and I knew what was up. So that morning you got drunk, uh, what were you thinking? I don't know, I just, uh, I woke up and there was that bottle of booze by the bed, and uh, I just started drinking it. And uh, a couple hours later, this girl came over and I said, let's take a ride, and we went over there. And, you know, what were you thinking though? Uh, I, I was, I just gotten fed up with being pissed, you know. I, uh, 
you know, it's like I turned 50 years old and she decided I was a punk, you know, and that wasn't happening. I mean, but why did you feel it was so important, a lawnmower? Did you ever see the big picture and think maybe taking someone's life wasn't wasn't worth this this object? Uh, you know, in hindsight, yeah, but uh, then I don't know. I, you know, maybe that's like I said. I stayed mad for a year and a half and was only, you know, I start to lose it when I got drunk, and that time I, I did. Did you ever stop at any moment and think that this is a bad idea while you're driving over? Apparently not. I yep. mean, what was going through your head during the drive? I, I have no idea. I don't even remember getting there. Is that true? Yeah. You don't remember any of it? No, I, they said my blood alcohol level was probably about 0 0.40, so. Okay, so you got to Toddy's house. Yeah and you left your girlfriend in the, in the vehicle. Yeah. And you went inside, what happened? Uh, well, I come in and I forget who spoke first, but I said something about the riding lawnmower and she said, Earl, I'll get you a lawnmower. I just kind of looked at her like, man, shut up. And uh, I don't know, she looked over at Mike that was Mike Wells, he was sitting on a couch with her. And uh, I guess be cold about it, to get his, her attention, I shot him. Why'd you shoot him? I just, I don't know. Well, because when she was telling me, I'll get you longer, I thought I saw her roll her eyes, you know, at, at Mike, like, oh, man, nice car to you. Did you, did you know Mike? Yeah. How'd he, you know him? he was one of the first people I met here. He worked worked at the liquor store. Yeah. What'd you think about him? Oh, I liked him. He's, he's a good dude. Why'd you shoot him? Because he was there. What were you, what, what message were you trying to send in shooting him? Well, I think I was uh, showing her that I was serious, and you know. What were you serious about? About getting my shit and uh, besides showing him her I was serious I, I imagined the thought of you know, not leaving anybody behind uh, across my mind that might have been foremost why did that cross your mind well I don't know, you people who you leave behind they tell on you you know because that's exactly what would have happened it doesn't matter that it's all illegal you know so, when you were going over there, you were planning on killing her. I believe so. Yeah. But you just weren't thinking about it. So going over there, like I said, I, I don't remember none of it. I can't, I don't. I was told I drove over there, but you know, I I can't see myself doing that, that being that drunk. But maybe I did. So after you shot Mike, what happened? I. Uh, well, I kind of spaced out, you know, and, and Dottie took that, that window there of opportunity and she ran out the front door and I fired some shots in her direction and I don't, didn't know if I hit her or not, but uh, she got into uh, Angela's car and tried to back it up and she got hung up on a, a guy wire for a uh, telephone post. And what'd you say to her? Uh, well, I just said, come on in, you know. We're, I, uh, Angela said I was telling her, you know, it's gonna be okay, uh, blah, 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 you know. Why were you telling her that? Uh, to get her in the house, I guess. Did you have any hesitation at all once she got in the house? I don't think so. So what happened after you shot Toddy? Uh, I, well, I guess Angela was in the house then and uh, gathered. I, I, I taken her in the bedroom and made her get, get her drugs out. 
So I grabbed the box that had the drugs and uh, we went home. Angela drove then. What'd you do back at your house? I mixed up some of the dope and shot some. Why'd you do that? Well, it seemed like I, you know, I had a pound and a half. I thought I could probably afford it, I guess. So after you got really high on meth, what happened then? That's when the, uh, the sheriff and the deputy pulled up to the front door. It's Bob Wofford and Joanne Barnes. Right. What happened? Well, you know, they, they got out of the car. She just started walking up and he was behind her. And that's when I pulled my gun out and he pulled his out and we started shooting at each other. What do you think we can learn from this? <laughs> well, first thing is don't let your kids do drugs, you know? And uh, there, there's, there has, there's gotta be a psychological problem with me more more than one, but you know, I just, I don't feel things like normal people do. I describe that. I don't know, I feel like my, uh, well, whatever uh, it is that makes you think about, you know, not doing something or it's, uh, it, uh, it, it screwed up. It, it may have never have worked, you know. Do you think that what happened would have happened if you hadn't been doing drugs? No, it wouldn't have. I want to give you the opportunity. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to talk about? Well, just uh, one good thing about this whole thing that did come out of it is that my daughter and I recontacted, you know, made contact again, and our relationship is really good. Do you, uh, I mean, do you love your daughter? Yes. Do you understand that the love you have for your daughter is the same love that Mike Wells' family had for, for him, or John I'm, Barnes' family had for them? I'm sure it is, yeah. And I mean, you still don't feel any remorse over that? For Mike and his family, I do. What about Toddy? No. You don't feel any remorse? No. Why? Because she knew what what the deal was, you know? She'd been in this for as, as long as I had almost, and, uh, you know? So you blame her for what happened? <laughs> yeah. I know that's kind of asshole of me, but yeah, I do. Do you feel remorse for Joanne Barnes? Not so much. Why? Because she's a cop and that she gets paid to carry a gun. Is there anything you want to say to the people of Denton County? They've already come to the conclusions that you know they want, and uh, probably most of them are right. Whatever they think about me. You know. What do you think they think? Uh, I'm just a piece of shit. Is that how you feel? No. Do you think that this is a just verdict that you're getting? Uh, for the time and place, yeah, I guess so. His execution began at 7.10 p.m. on May 11th, and he was pronounced dead eight minutes later. The contradistinction of acceptance and honesty, in comparison to denial and deception, can illustrate the various psychological terminals in which an inmate is led to while living on death row. Although stark opposites, they each shared mental stability and soundness of mind. The influence and medium of the death row phenomenon had failed to strip away enough metaphysical structure to induce psychosis and derangement. A a precise example of how the conditions of the death row phenomenon can slowly turn a prisoner insane is the case of Eileen Wernos, labeled the Damsel of Death and convicted of killing seven men in Florida between 1989 and 1990 while working as a prostitute. A multitude of media outlets conducted interviews throughout her time on death row, which documented the swaying of her mental state from relatively balanced and rational to completely frenzied and maniacal. I 
still say to myself, I still say that it was just about to be them. Because most of them either were going to start to beat me up or were going to screw me down. You know, I can tell you when you don't catch it. So I fight them and I get away from them. And then I, you know, as I get away from them, I run to the front of the car or jump over the seat or whatever, grab my gun and just don't shoot. Which they would be out of the car most of them would be new. Because they just were close to them. And then they didn't, you know, <coughs> didn't think about running back in a car or anything. I would start shooting out from out of the car. Do you wish to be represented by counsel? Yes, I do. Can you afford to hire an attorney? No, sir. Do you work? No. Uh, I'm in jail. How can I work? <laughs> well, obviously you're not working now, but how long has it been since you've last worked? Oh, uh, about... Oh, 84, possibly. You hadn't worked in six or seven years? How do you, how do you support yourself? I'm a professional call girl. Do you own any property here in the state of Florida? you own a motor vehicle of any kind? Pardon? Do you own a motor vehicle of any kind? No, sir. If you'll sign an affidavit, I will appoint the public defender to represent you. And Ms. Warner, she's been ordered in this warrant to be held without bail. That will be my order. I say it's this. The principle is self-defense. They say it's the number. I say it's the principle. The heck with what... It, it, it has nothing to do with the number killed. It's the principle. But they're saying if there is a number... No. Self-defense is self-defense no matter how many times it is. I don't care if it's a hundred times. I was very, I never provoked those guys. I never provoked them. I never showed any provocations whatsoever. It was very nice, very decent, very clean, very ladylike. I didn't even swear in front of my clients. And a lot of my clients, I talked about Jesus and I talked political. Both mixed together and we never argued. So there was no provocation whatsoever. There was no need for them to look for the closest weapon in the vehicle and try to use it on me to rape me. Two did, five tried. I have made peace with my Lord and I have asked forgiveness. I am sorry that my acts of self-defense ended up in court like this, but I take full responsibility for my actions. It was them or me. I am sorry for all the pain that my actions have caused. I am prepared to die if you say it is necessary. But I am not By pleading guilty, it appeared that Lee Walnos was in reality hoping for mercy and forgiveness, but that is not what happened. I sentence you in case number 91-463 to death for the murder of Troy Burris. Case number 91-304, I sentence you to death for the murder of Charles Humphreys. Case number 91-112, Citrus County case number, I sentence you to death for the murder of David Spears. Thank you. And uh, probably see, uh, I'll be up in heaven while y'all are rotting in hell. Okay, there will be an automatic appeal. You have the right to an appeal. Mr. Glazer, is that going to be handled by you May or the public defender? May your wife and defender? kids uh, get raped. I would ask that uh, you would appoint right the public the defender's ass. office. Okay, I'll, I'll appoint the public defender's office uh, to handle the appeal. There's one other thing that I want to say that I think needs to be said. I knew I was raped. You weren't nothing but a bunch of scum. Therefore, these proceedings are now Putting completed. Putting somebody who was raped to death? You know, I was just wondering how you're going to be, you know, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Are you prepared? I'm prepared. I'm all right. I'm all right with it. Couldn't even get a fair trial. Couldn't even get a fair investigation or nothing. You sabotaged my ass, society, and the cops, and the system. A raped woman got executed. I got a big finger in all your faces. Thanks a lot. You're inhuman. You're an inhumane bunch of fucking living bastards and bitches. And you're going to get your asses nuked in the end. And pretty soon it's coming. 2019, a rock's supposed to hit you anyhow. You're all going to get nuked. We're going to have to cut this interview, Nick. I'm not going to go into any more detail. I'm leaving. I'm glad. Thanks a lot, Society, for railroading my ass. Okay, let's go. 
She was executed by lethal injection just 13 hours later and pronounced dead at 9.47 a.m. She declined a final meal but drank a black coffee instead. Her last statement was, I'd just like to say I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus, June 6, like the movie, Big Mothership and all. I'll be back. Capital punishment is essentially an ethical paradox. The subjects of morality, deterrence, and retribution are used in equal measure on both sides of the death penalty debate. Yet, setting aside whether you're an advocate or a skeptic of judicial execution, try and instead recognize what can be learned from the psychological findings of its use. Just under 30% of death sentences in the United States are reduced to life imprisonment upon appeal, and a plethora of studies have been conducted on this classification of prisoner regarding their state of mind before, during, and after legal proceedings. It's been discovered that not only are the vast majority in a far better place mentally than they were while living on death row, but their state of well-being exceeded how it was before they were even locked up to begin with. They had become happier people serving a life sentence inside a maximum security facility than they had been experiencing life on the outside. This included highly affluent and prosperous figures such as millionaires and people with large families and support systems. The longer an individual had been subjected to the death row phenomenon, the further the gap was in their contentment and equanimity regarding pre- and post-incarceration. They were able to experience stronger emotions of joy, excitement, and contentment, combined with deeper feelings of meaning and purpose. They were equipped with a positive mindset in the present and an optimistic outlook for the future, albeit inside a high-security penitentiary. Family became more meaningful, and the feelings of love and devotion became far more cogent and powerful. The limited family visits, or even a simple phone call, was able to be embraced and absorbed. Even the most trivial things, such as a hot shower or decent night's sleep, became inundated with appreciation. The neurological studies have discovered that the traumatic experience of death row had literally changed the molecular structure of the brain. In simpler terms, the subject's cognitive processing had been rewired. Their way of thinking and feeling had completely transformed. They were able to invest in perceiving the world with dedicated focus on the positives, and were able to find any authentic reason to give thanks. Not forced or spurious, but genuine gratitude, which by casual sequence elevates mood, willpower, and motivation. The studies inferred that it was a biochemical anomaly of being human, and somewhat of an absurdity, that it will often take an experience of extreme anguish to become the catalyst for profound change and transformation. The established resolution that the studies came to was clear-cut, albeit far from simple, which is for us to tap into and hardwire the same areas of our cognitive database to acquire this same beneficial outlook on life. Many psychiatrists and philosophers share the doctrine that we don't need to purposefully subject ourselves to severe trauma or overwhelming hardship to attain this level of enlightenment, but instead find the right method of gaining insight and awareness that will integrate with our own subjective psychology. No one's mental processes are in the same bracket. Different methods will work for different people. The trick is finding what will work for you, and there are three substantial precedents known to be effective. The first is exposing yourself to something out of the norm, and the further from the norm, the better, such as traveling to a distant part of the world, or taking up an unfamiliar avocation. The second is the pursuit of individual growth through finding meaning. This is essentially becoming part of something bigger than yourself and focusing your motivations outward, such as assistance to family, service to community, or even pursuing a profession that will benefit humanity. The final and arguably the most recognized approach is getting outside your comfort zone, which is where the famous quote of former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt came from. The degree of appliance will vary from person to person, as some will find it best to approach this method in baby steps, while others will go the opposite way and take a far more enterprising and audacious approach. Perhaps the most important thing to note is that although these practices are validated advice, the overwhelming majority of avenues haven't been written in literature as a means for guidance, or even known of or experienced yet, and it's up to you to go out and find as many as you possibly can.